Welcome to the audio version of the Best Practice Guidance, Creating Accessible Primary Care Services for People with Sensory Loss. Information from the Northern Ireland Health and Social Care Board. Section 1. Introduction. The purpose of this document is to provide guidance for commissioners, health and social care trusts, GPs, nurses and practice managers to help improve access to primary care services for people who are deaf, have a hearing loss or are blind or partially sighted. One in six people in Northern Ireland has a hearing loss, around 300,000 people. Around 50,000 people here have significant sight difficulties. The deafblind charity Sense estimates there are approximately 250,000 deafblind people in the UK. Many people, particularly elderly people, experience joint sensory loss, and as our population ages, the figure is likely to rise. This means that a substantial proportion of the population will have additional needs when accessing primary health care. This guidance has been developed by Action on Hearing Loss and RNIB Northern Ireland, with the support of the Health and Social Care Board, in response to the findings and recommendations identified by Action on Hearing Loss, the RNIB and the British Deaf Association in their research report, published in 2009, titled, Is It My Turn Yet? Many of the respondents in the research indicated that they needed guidance and help in ensuring their services were fully accessible. We hope that the steps outlined in this document will provide a practical approach to improving access to and awareness of the needs of people with sensory disability when accessing primary care. This guidance focuses on their needs when attending a doctor's appointment, but can equally be applied in other primary health care settings. Note that for the purposes of this guidance, we use the term people with a hearing loss to cover all kinds of deafness, and we use the term people with a sight loss to cover all degrees of significant sight loss. Section 2. Background Research in the UK and much anecdotal information provided to the leading sensory disability charities indicate that people with sensory disability are finding primary health care services difficult to access. Is It My Turn Yet? showed that less than half of the GP practices surveyed, 47%, had made reasonable adjustments specifically for people with a sensory disability, despite the provisions of the Disability Discrimination Act 2005. The findings also revealed that there was a general lack of awareness of the needs of people with sensory disability when accessing primary care, a lack of training for staff in this area, a shortage of suitable assistive technology, and gaps in policies and procedures to meet the communication and mobility needs of service users with a sensory disability. Poor access to services has a detrimental effect on those who need them. For example, Action on Hearing Loss's report, Access All Areas, published in 2013, indicated that one in seven respondents, 14%, had missed an appointment because they hadn't been aware of their name being called in the waiting room. Around a quarter, 26%, had been unclear about health advice they were given. RNIB research indicates that 72% of people with sight loss can't read the information given to them by their GP. And one in five service users, 22%, has missed an appointment due to information being sent in a format they couldn't read. The consequences of poor access can be serious if service users aren't properly informed that their appointment time is due, or if they're not able to access the consultation room themselves, vital appointments can be missed. If service users don't understand or can't read information regarding medication, this could lead to the wrong dose being taken. Section 3. Legal Responsibilities the right of people with sensory disability to access healthcare services is enshrined in law. Providers of primary healthcare services are obliged to take action to ensure their services are accessible to all. The Disability Discrimination Act 1995, the DDA, aims to stop discrimination against people with disabilities. 
the DDA seeks to give people with disabilities equal and enforceable rights and access to employment, education, property, transport and goods, facilities and services. The DDA says that service providers, employers and similar aren't allowed to discriminate against disabled people by refusing to provide a service or offering a service of a lower standard or in less favourable terms because of the disability. The DDA applies to all healthcare providers, including GPs, hospitals, pharmacies, health centres, paramedics, dentists and opticians. The DDA requires service providers to make changes to their services to ensure that disabled people can make use of them. This is known as the duty to make reasonable adjustments. Reasonable adjustments include providing additional aids such as loop or infrared broadcast systems, and additional or accessible information, for example in Braille, or additional services such as communication support like a BSL or English interpreter to enable disabled people to access the service or make it easier for them to do so. Service providers have to make adjustments required even if it means making a change to their premises or their fixtures and fittings. The practices, policies and procedures of an organisation are covered by reasonable adjustments. This means that if the way you operate makes it impossible or unreasonably difficult for disabled service users to use your service, then you need to change the way you operate. If a service provider doesn't make a reasonable adjustment, and it is impossible or unreasonably difficult for a disabled person to use the service, then the DDA says that that is discrimination. Making reasonable adjustments now can help your service users and save everyone time and money that should be used for service user care. If you're a manager, you need to support healthcare staff to provide the best possible care for people who are deaf or have a hearing loss and people who are blind or partially sighted. The United Nations Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities, the UNCRPD, is an international treaty that aims to ensure the dignity, human rights and freedoms of all people with disabilities in Northern Ireland are respected, promoted and protected. It also outlines the obligations on the United Kingdom to promote, protect and ensure those rights. The Convention explains that all disabled people have and should be able to enjoy the same human rights as other people. It sets an international benchmark for the human rights of disabled people. The areas covered by the Convention include health, education, employment, access to justice, personal security, independent living and access to information. Government and public bodies will be expected to make decisions and deliver services which take into account the rights contained in the Convention. For example, the government must make sure that buildings and services are accessible to disabled people, including workplaces, schools, medical facilities and transport and must provide information intended for the general public in accessible formats and technologies such as large print, audio, braille and sign language. Article 25 of the Convention outlines disabled people's rights to health services including the overarching right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health without discrimination on the basis of disability. It states that the government and public bodies shall take all appropriate measures to ensure access for persons with disabilities to health services. In particular, to provide persons with disabilities with the same range, quality and standard of free or affordable health care and programmes as provided to other persons. To provide these health services as close as possible to people's own communities, including in rural areas to require health professionals to provide care of the same quality to persons with disabilities as to others, including on the basis of free and informed consent by inter alia raising awareness of the human rights, dignity, autonomy and needs of persons with disabilities through training and the promulgation of ethical standards for public and private health care. To prohibit discrimination against persons with disabilities in the provision of health and to prevent discriminatory denial of health care or health service. Section 4. Access to the practice. Consideration of the needs of people with a sensory disability should begin before an appointment is made. In 2009, only 46% of GP practices in Northern Ireland enabled service users to make contact by email and none provided an SMS option. 
so do establish an email address to enable service users to contact the practice. Publish the email address on headed paper, voicemail messages and promotional material. Establish internal procedures to ensure that emails are monitored regularly. Introduce the use of SMS or texting system for communicating with service users. Provide training for staff on using text relay and provide a quick guide to using text relay and display it in reception. Consider establishing an online booking system which is compatible with screen reading software commonly used by people with sight loss. Audit any online booking systems for AA compliance with the guidelines set out by the World Wide Web Consortium's Web Access Initiative or compliance with Public Access Standards 78. Consider including key information on your website in video format with sign language translation and subtitling. If a text phone is available in the practice, advertise the text phone number on all promotional materials and headed paper. Provide training for staff on using the text phone and provide a quick guide to using it displayed in reception. Ensure services for prescriptions or results are accessible, provided by email, SMS, text relay and text phone. Consider providing an open surgery system to allow service users to visit without having to make an appointment. Allow assistance dogs into the practice, such as hearing dogs for the deaf, wearing a scarlet coat, and guide dogs for the blind, with a yellow harness. Ensure the premises uses colour contrasting and is well lit with clear signage. Ensure walkways are kept clear of hazards, and offer a computerised check-in system at reception. Don't use automated call direction systems for text relay users. Text Relay is a national telephone relay service letting people who are deaf or have a hearing loss use a text phone to access any services available on standard phone systems. It operates 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. A practice doesn't need any new or special equipment to use Text Relay. The link between the service user and the practice is a highly trained Text Relay operator who provides a discreet and confidential service. For outgoing calls from the practice to a UK landline or mobile number, the call shouldn't cost you more per minute via text relay than it would for a voice call, although it may take longer. Because calls from a text phone can take longer, some telecommunications providers offer a refund for text phone calls. The service user dials 1801 followed by the full telephone number from their text phone. When the call is answered by the surgery, the text relay operator is brought into the call. The service user types a message using their keyboard and the operator reads it word for word to the practice staff. The practice staff then respond verbally and the text relay operator types exactly what is said so the service user can read the conversation on their text phone display. Practice staff can also use text relay to contact a service user by dialing 1802 followed by the service user's number. In Northern Ireland, people who are deaf or have a hearing loss use various methods of communication, including speech and lip reading, but British Sign Language, or BSL, is the most widely used method of signed communication. If you want to book communication support for your service users, you can ask them if they'd like one of the following. BSL English interpreters, Irish Sign Language English interpreters, deafblind and partially sighted interpreters, lip speakers, speech-to-text reporters, electronic note-takers or manual note-takers. Communication support services are in great demand, so it's best to book with as much notice as possible. When you book, give as much information about the assignment as possible, including dates, times and the full address of the venue. It can also help if you supply some background information in advance. For example, is it a consultation? How many people are involved? How long will it last? It's imperative that communication professionals used by healthcare providers are registered with the National Registers of Communication Professionals. This ensures they're qualified to the correct standard to enable accurate communication of vital medical information. Such registration means that the communication professional meets the national occupational standards for their chosen profession, is held accountable to a code of conduct, updates their skills through compulsory continuing professional development, 
meets the annual requirement to make the fit and proper persons declaration of their professional integrity, has an enhanced criminal record disclosure certificate which must be available on request, and holds professional indemnity insurance for all the work they carry out. Section 5. Information In 2009, only one GP practice out of 99 offered information in Braille format. So review all your information to determine if it meets the needs of people with a sensory disability. Involve service users with sensory disabilities to produce accessible information. Provide all information about the practice in at least 14 point and meet the RNIB's clear print guidelines for written material. On all information, the following sentence should appear in large print, at least 20 point. It should say, If you require this information in accessible format such as Braille, large print or audio, then please contact us on and then give contact details. Arrange to provide information in another format after the appointment if required, and within a period of no more than three working days. Provide all information in clear, plain English. Consider making information available on DVD with signed and subtitled content. Ensure that all staff know how and where to get information produced in a range of formats. And check that service users understand the information you've provided to them. Section 6. Communication Without learning some deaf-specific communication skills, it can be virtually impossible for a service user to follow what's happening in their appointment. Just being aware of the possibility that the service user you're speaking to may be deaf or have a hearing or sight loss will help you to change the way you communicate with them. So, with the service user's consent, prominently record their communication and mobility needs on file, both on paper and electronically. Provide information to staff on how to meet service users' communication or mobility needs, for instance, a current telephone number to book an interpreter, or the mechanism for ordering an audio or braille copy of a health information leaflet. Establish a mechanism to pass on service users' communication or mobility needs at referral, for instance by including a tick box on paper referrals. Publicise the fact that service users who are deaf or have a hearing loss are entitled to receive communication support. Actively raise awareness of communication support services. Make a member of staff available if needed to guide the service user to the waiting room and up to the reception desk. As well as providing an audio alert for the service user, a member of staff should approach them to let them know their appointment time has arrived. Reception staff should identify themselves to the service user and make it clear that they are addressing them. When calling a service user forward for their appointment, offer whatever assistance may be needed. This will include basics such as calling a person's name and waiting for them to stand up, then offering an elbow to escort them, or tapping a person who is deaf on the shoulder to let them know it's their turn. Routinely offer to escort someone with sight loss to their destination within the practice or health centre. At the beginning of a consultation, ask any service user who is deaf, has a hearing loss or is blind or partially sighted whether the room is suitable for communication, for example, lighting, the position of the doctor in relation to the service user. Meeting rooms should be well lit and equipped with working loop systems. Wall decor should be plain and background noise should be kept to a minimum. Check with a deaf service user and sign language interpreter that everyone is positioned in a way to ensure optimum communication. GPs or nurses should escort service users with sight loss back to the waiting area or to the main exit after the appointment if they require it. Ask service users whether and what kind of communication support is required. Have policies and procedures in place to capture these requirements and enable communication support to be booked as and when required. Inform staff of contact details for the sign language agency your trust has a contract with. Allow extra time for sign language users as communication can be slower. And consider using the services of an interpreter in a block booking, that is making appointments for service users who are deaf back to back. 
Don't look at your computer screen whilst talking to someone who has a hearing loss. And don't leave the room without telling someone with sight loss that you're doing so. When communicating with someone who is mind or partially sighted, address the person directly. Don't speak instead to the person accompanying them. Identify yourself and any others in the room. Describe any new area to the blind or partially sighted person. This is particularly important when a person with serious sight loss encounters a new environment, such as entering a new room for the first time. Imagine leaving a blind person at the top of a flight of stairs, but not telling them the stairs are there. It's important to describe the immediate environment, particularly if it's possibly hazardous. They may need to know where the exits, toilets and seating are in relation to their current position. Explain where you place items. For example, there's a cup of coffee in front of you, just to the right. Use day-to-day -day words and phrases. Don't worry about using phrases such as see you later or did you see Coronation Street last night. And tell the person if you leave the room. Remember that people with serious sight loss don't have the visual cue of seeing someone leaving. It's also very important that they're not left standing around waiting after you've gone. You'll also need to let them know when you've re-entered the room. When communicating with someone with a hearing loss, don't be afraid to ask the person how they would prefer you to communicate. Find a suitable place to talk, with good lighting away from noise and distractions. Make sure you have the listener's attention before you start speaking. Remember not to turn your face away from someone who's deaf. Always turn back to your listener so they can see your face. Even if someone is wearing a hearing aid, it doesn't mean that they can hear you easily. Speak clearly, but not too slowly, and don't exaggerate your lip movements. Use natural facial expressions and gestures. If someone doesn't understand what you've said, don't just keep repeating yourself, try saying it in a different way. The room should be well lit, without having too much light behind you. Keep a pen and paper handy in case you need to write something down, and remember to write clearly and legibly. And use plain language, don't waffle. Avoid jargon or unfamiliar abbreviations. Section 7. Training Half of all staff in local GP practices haven't had any training in dealing with people who are deaf or blind or partially sighted. So provide all reception staff with deaf awareness training. Consider training for staff in tailored, work-related, basic British or Irish sign language. Provide all reception staff with accredited visual awareness and guiding training. Consider using a disabled person to deliver awareness training, as is best practice. Nominate at least one team member to be responsible for this element of service user care throughout the practice. Provide training for all staff on how to use text relay. Provide training on the use of induction loop systems. Include training on how to manage the evacuation of deaf and or blind and partially sighted people as part of emergency evacuation training. Provide this training as part of induction and on a rolling basis as part of ongoing staff training. Section 8. Equipment and Technology Less than a third of GP practices had installed a flashing smoke alarm for deaf service users. This could have very serious consequences in the event of a fire. So install an induction loop system in reception areas. This can either be a permanent fixture or a portable system. Install an induction loop in all consultation rooms. If that's not possible, one or two dedicated rooms should be fitted with a loop and hearing aid users should have their appointments in those rooms. Check the induction loop is maintained regularly. Ensure staff know how to use the loop. Display a sign advertising the existence of the system in a place clearly visible to service users. If a text phone is available in the practice, provide training for staff on using it and provide a quick guide to using the text phone displayed in reception. Provide a touch screen system to enable service users to check in for an appointment. Install a combined visual and audio board to alert service users to their appointment. Install a flashing smoke alarm in all areas which could be used by a person with a hearing loss. 
and ensure that any television provided in the waiting room has subtitles enabled and switched on. Section 9. Policies and Procedures It's vital that the needs of people who are deaf, have a hearing loss, or are blind or partially sighted are taken into account when writing policies and procedures. This ensures that foresight, not afterthought, is applied to access. So carry out a disability access audit across all aspects of the practice. Establish a procedure to ensure that incoming emails are monitored regularly and responded to in a reasonable time. Establish procedures to book communication support, such as BSL interpreters, lip speakers and note takers. Have a protocol in place to undertake an ID check to ensure that communication professionals are registered with the NRCPD. Ensure that emergency procedures include helping to evacuate a person with sight or hearing loss from the building. And make complaints procedures fully accessible to people who are deaf or have a hearing loss or are blind or partially sighted and promote them as such. Section 10. An example of best practice. The Hunter family practice in Craigavon has undertaken significant work in recent years to ensure that its services are fully accessible to people with hearing or sight loss or learning disabilities. It's been awarded the Action on Hearing Loss Charter Mark, Louder Than Words, and the Management in Practice Awards for both customer care and innovation in training. The changes to practice and procedures and the resulting improvement in access for deaf and blind or partially sighted people have been led by the practice manager Lorraine Hughes, who has received full support and encouragement from the practice owners, the Hunter family. All staff in the practice have received training in deaf awareness, visual awareness, introduction to BSL signing, use of text relay and text phone, and RNIB guiding training. Two staff have gained level one qualifications in BSL. Update training takes place annually for all clinical and admin staff. The practice purchased a mobile for those who prefer to text the practice and wrote to all deaf service users to promote the dedicated mobile number. The phone is kept at reception and staff check regularly for messages and use the phone to contact service users when necessary. The practice has improved record keeping, including collating a register of all service users who are deaf, have a hearing loss or are blind or partially sighted. Electronic service user records have been amended to include a pop-up alert to make staff aware of any sensory disability needs. All literature in the practice has been provided in clear, plain English and in easy-to-read type. The practice manager has completed a plain English course by the Plain English Campaign. Policies and procedures include a deaf or hard-of-hearing service user policy, a protocol for referral of deaf service users to the treatment room, a protocol for the booking of a BSL interpreter or other language service, a protocol for induction loop testing, a protocol for home visits, and a protocol for evacuation in an emergency. Staff have been provided with an information pack, providing support and resources, and is useful for staff induction. The pack includes the fingerspelling alphabet, communication tips, policies and protocols, useful phone numbers, instructions on using text relay and text phone, and action on hearing loss resources. RNIB visual awareness training is given. Participants receive an information pack including notes on communication and guiding techniques. There's visual awareness training from the Southern Trust Sensory Disability Team, providing information packs for reception and treatment room staff. The practice has established a relationship with Queen Alexandra College to arrange for printed documents to be converted quickly into Braille, large print or audio. Induction loops have been fitted in all consulting rooms and reception areas. A portable induction loop is available for house calls. A visual and audio service user call system has been installed in the waiting room. A protocol is established where the receptionist or GP will go to the waiting room to offer assistance if a service user with visual problems is called. A digital television with subtitles enabled has been installed in the waiting room. Flashing lights linked to the fire alarm have been installed throughout the health centre. 
clear evacuation plans are displayed prominently in the health centre, and changes were communicated to service users by letter, and all deaf or blind and partially sighted service users were surveyed to ensure access arrangements were appropriate and useful. Service users said, When I had an appointment with Dr Raymond, he used sign language. I felt brilliant and pleased with him. I have very low vision, and I love that my doctor took the trouble to find out how best to help me when I come to the surgery. Dr Denise showed me the loop system. I'm proud of the service. Keep it up. All staff are very helpful when I come to the surgery. A receptionist, or sometimes even the doctor, comes to the waiting room for me when it's my turn. I've used text relay to order prescriptions and staff are very patient. It's a good service. I love the display in the waiting room and the poster to let deaf people know to ask for communication support. Everyone seems to know that I might need some extra help when I come to the doctors. I really appreciate it. Staff at the practice have also benefited from the changes, feeling enthused and motivated and reporting an increase in job satisfaction as a result. Team working has improved and staff have enjoyed raising awareness of their improved communications, receiving very positive feedback from service users. Changes to the practice have been possible through the use of prescribing savings and training has been provided through regular protected practice learning sessions. A tour of the practice and the changes made can be found at actiononhearingloss.org.uk slash hunterpractice. Finally, Section 11, Further Sources of Information, Guidance and Support. A range of contact details, starting with Hearing Loss and Deafness. Action on Hearing Loss, Northern Ireland. The address is Harvester House, 4 to 8 Adelaide Street, Belfast, BT2 8GA. Telephone 0289 023 9619. Text phone 0289 024 9462. Email information.nireland at hearingloss.org.uk. Visit actiononhearingloss.org.uk. Action on Hearing Loss is the charity working for a world where hearing loss, deafness and tinnitus don't limit or label people, and where people value their hearing. If you need to book communication support for service users, call 0289 033 1320 or email CSU Belfast at hearingloss.org.uk. If you need equipment such as induction loops, you'll find a huge range of products at actiononhearingloss.org.uk/shop. If you need a technician to install your equipment, go to actiononhearingloss.org.uk/product-installation. Action on Hearing Loss provides a consultation service and best practice charter mark louder than words, helping you to become fully accessible to people with hearing loss. Visit actiononhearingloss.org.uk slash louder than words. There's the British Deaf Association Northern Ireland, the BDANI. The address is Unit 5C, Weaver's Court, Linfield Road, Belfast. BT 12 5GH, telephone 02890 437480, email bda at bda.org.uk, visit the website at bda.org.uk. The BDA's mission is to ensure a world in which the language, culture, community, diversity and heritage of deaf people in the UK are respected and fully protected ensuring that deaf people can participate and contribute as equal and valued citizens in the wider society. The BDA achieves this through community advocacy work, community development projects, policy and campaigns work, including the BSL Charter and consultations. Then there's Hands That Talk. The address is 116 Main Street, Dungiven, County Londonderry. BT 47 4LG, telephone 0287 774 2776, text phone 0791 221 0803, email info at handsthattalk.co.uk, visit the website handsthattalk.co.uk. 
Hands That Talk is committed to improving the lives of the deaf community, providing a range of services and opportunities. If you need to book communication support for service users, please contact them using the contact details just given. They currently hold a contract for the Western Health and Social Care Trust and operate an emergency communication support service for patients living in the Western Trust area. To book communication support for emergency purposes, call 079-122-10803. Then there's the Northern Ireland Deaf Youth Association, the NIDYA. The address is Office 16, Townsend Enterprise Park, 28 Townsend Street, Belfast. BT 13 2ES. Visit nidya.org or email info at nidya.org. The NIDYA is a deaf youth organisation delivering support for deaf children and young people, offering a weekly children's club for deaf children aged 4 to 11 and a youth club for deaf young people aged 12 to 17, delivered in different regions across Northern Ireland. The clubs enable deaf children and young people to fulfil their potential and pursue new opportunities. Social get-togethers are organised for deaf teenagers living across the province once a month in Belfast. Personal development and sign language sessions are offered to deaf teenagers. Volunteering opportunities are on offer for anyone aged 16 and over. The address for the National Deaf Children's Society is 38 to 42 Hill Street, Belfast, BT1 to LB. Telephone 0289 031 3170, that's the voice number. The fax number 0289 027 8205. The text phone number 0289 027 8177. Or visit ndcs.org.uk. Hearing Link is a UK charity providing information and support to people with hearing loss, their friends and family, focusing on those who communicate by listening, lip reading and text transcription. Hearing Link is a friendly and knowledgeable organisation and a great point of contact for anyone who's adjusting to hearing loss or managing the challenges it can bring. Hearing Link is now offering specialised rehabilitation and self-management programmes in Northern Ireland. The address for Hearing Link Northern Ireland is 23 Enterprise House, Lisbon Enterprise Centre, Lisbon, BT28 2BP. Telephone or SMS 07534 563 451. Email northernireland at hearinglink.org. Email the help desk at inquiries at hearinglink.org or visit the website hearinglink.org. DeafBlind UK Connections Northern Ireland works with older people who suffer from dual sensory impairment, that is a level of hearing and sight loss, providing peer support and befriending. Peer support groups are planned for Belfast, Newton Abbey, Antrim, Armagh, Downpatrick and Newry. The volunteer befriending service aims to reduce social isolation and loneliness experienced by people with dual sensory loss. People will be matched with a volunteer who offers befriending services in the person's own home or another convenient location by telephone or email. DeafBlind NI will also introduce its members to the benefits of new digital technology to assist them with their day-to-day -day activities and needs. Connections Northern Ireland accepts referrals via social services teams, other organisations working in the voluntary sector and directly from individuals, their friends or family. Call Norman McCudden on 07950 or email norman.mccudden at deafblind.org.uk. The RNIB Northern Ireland pledges to support blind and partially sighted people to live independently and to campaign for their full inclusion in society. RNIB is a registered charity with three clear priorities – stopping people losing their sight unnecessarily, supporting blind and partially sighted people to live independently, and creating an inclusive society. The RNIB provides advice on accessibility and awards service providers who meet its accessibility standards through its Excellence Programme. Information on this is available from RNIB Northern Ireland. The head office address is Victoria House, 
15 to 17 Gloucester Street, Belfast, BT14LS. Telephone 02890 329 373. Email rnibni at rnib.org.uk or visit rnib.org.uk slash Northern Ireland. Fiona Brown is the Northern Ireland Manager for Guide Dogs Northern Ireland. Telephone 0845 or email fiona.brown at guidedogs.org.uk. Maxine Moore is the Chairperson of Angel Eyes Northern Ireland. Telephone 07582 719 or email mmore at angelizedni.org. Colette Gray is Head of Services Northern Ireland for Sense. Telephone 02890 833 or email colette.gray at sense.org.uk. Rosaline Dempsey works for Albinism Fellowship. Telephone 02890 329 or email rosaline.dempsey at rnib.org.uk. Mrs. Marion McCabe works for RP Fighting Blindness. Telephone 02838 or email marion at rmcc.co.uk. Michelle Dutton is the Group Support and Development Manager for the Macula Society. Telephone 0161 491 6081 or email michelle.d at maculasociety.org. For more on Text Relay, visit textrelay.org slash files slash typetalkleaflet v7.pdf. To find out more on alternative formats, visit allformats.org.uk. For more on the Equality Commission, go to equalityni.org. For more on the DDA, go to equalityni.org slash archive slash pdf slash servprovfin.pdf. For more on the UNCRPD, go to equalityni.org slash archive slash pdf slash UNCRPD short guide F dot PDF. A campaign called Our Health in Your Hands has been launched for the deaf community to raise awareness of their right under law to have a qualified interpreter in a healthcare setting and how to make a complaint. Go to ohyh.org.uk. To contact Health and Social Care Trust Sensory Support Services, for the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust, the address is the Sensory Support Service, 2nd Floor, Bradbury Centre, 1-17 Lisbon Road, Belfast, BT97AA, telephone 0289-504-0200, fax 0289-091-2196, Text phone 0289-091-2197. Mobile for text messages only 077 or email sensory support at belfasttrust.hscni.net. For referrals to the Northern Ireland and Social Care Trust, Telephone 0845 600 3111. For Triangle, Ballymoney and Moyle, the address is Rathley House, Mount Fern Complex, Colrain, BT 52, 1JL. For Antrim and Ballymena, the address is Wilson House, 17 Raceview Road, Brofshane, BT 42, 4JL. For East Antrim, the address is Covering Lawn, Ballyclare, Carrick, Fergus and Newton Abbey, The Beaches, 76 Avondale Drive, Ballyclare, BT 39 9EB. For Mid Ulster, covering Cookstown and Mafferfelt Townlands, the address is Mafferfelt CSC, 60 Hospital Road, BT 45 5EX. For the Southern Health and Social Care Trust, the team covering Craigavon and Banbridge, South Down and east of the Newry Canal, 
is based at Cherry Trees Resource Centre, 1A Edenderry Gardens, Guildford Road, Porterdown, BT 63 5EA. Telephone 028-3839-4088. Fax 028-3839-4095. Text phone 028-3839-4738 or the mobile number 078-349-29124. The team covering Armagh and Dungannon, South Armagh and west of the Nuri Canal, is based at the Sensory Disability Team, Jackson Hall, Main Building, St Luke's Hospital, Lofgal Road, Armagh, BT 617NQ, telephone 028-3741-2364, fax 028-3741-2087. Text phone 028-3741-2421. The mobile number 079-1910-3501. For the South Eastern Health and Social Care Trust, the North Down and Arts sector number is 028-9151-0136. The mobile number 07734-282-646. Text phone 0289-151-0137. The number for the Downs sector is 028-4461-6915. The mobile number 077-398-79556. The text phone number 028-4464-744. The number for the Lisburn sector is 0289-260-7746. The mobile number 077398795454. The text phone number 02892603120. And for the Western Health and Social Care Trust, the Northern Sector covering Derry and Londonderry, Limavady, Dungibbon and Straban. The address is Sensory Support Services, Old Bridge House, Glendermot Road, Londonderry, BT 476AU. Telephone 0287-132-0167. Text phone 0287-132-0166. Email gloria.mcdade at westerntrust.hscni.net. The southern sector covering the Amar Council area, the Castle Derg area, Enniskillen and Fermanagh. The address is Sensory Support Service, Drumcoo Centre, Drum Coo, Enniskillen, County Fermanagh, BT 74 6AY. Telephone 028 6632 4400. Text 077 9565 0125. Email martina.dempster at for out of hours, the regional telephone number is 0289-504-9999. For emergency social work service, text 077-9986-7698. That completes this information. <laughs>